All right, everybody, welcome to the Stellar Open Protocol discussion. Um, thanks for being here. Thanks to all the panelists. Just a reminder, the goal of these meetings is to talk about and plan for changes to upcoming versions of the Stellar Protocol. Specifically, we go over core advancement proposals, CAPS for short, which are open source specs that describe suggested new features designed to evolve the protocol to meet ecosystem needs. So CAPS, they have a life cycle. They go through various phases discussion, draft, final comment period, acceptance, and implementation before they're finalized, added to a major release of Stellar Core, and put forward to validators who ultimately decide whether or not to accept the changes by upgrading the network. So actually, if all goes well today, we may attempt to move a cap from draft to final comment period. We'll see what happens. Very exciting procedural stuff there. Um, if we do, we'll post a notice on the Stellar Dev mailing list, and there's a link to that in the meeting description. Uh, at which point anyone who has comments or questions or suggestions has one week to respond before we decide to either reopen the discussion or mark the cap as accepted. So that's what happens if we move this cap into final comment period. So last time we started the meeting with personal introductions, um, but today I think we'll skip that just to keep things moving along. All the participants are listed in the event descriptions. So if you wanna know who's who, just do a quick search or look at last, last protocol meeting where it was a lot of the same participants. Um, there's also a Q&A box where you can submit questions. We probably won't go through them one by one during the meeting, but we do look at them. They do inform our discussions and decisions. So if you have a question about what we're discussing, and again, please, about what we're discussing, feel free to raise it there. So fair warning, this is a technical discussion about a specific proposal. And if you want to keep up, I suggest reading through the cap, which is also linked to in the meeting description. That'll give you context. Now, today. Today, we will continue our discussion from the last meeting about CAP 35, which defines a method for allowing an issuer to claw back an asset in order to support regulatory requirements. So it could be used, for instance, to recover assets that have been fraudulently obtained, to respond to regulatory actions, or to enable someone who can prove their identity to recover an asset in the event of key loss or theft. Now, remember I said we do actually pay attention to the QA. Well, based on some questions that came in last time, it seems like there's a bit of confusion about this proposal. So before we begin, I just want to give a quick overview to attempt to clarify a few things. So based on questions that came in last time, um, th this is kind of what I, I, I want to uh, point out, right? The proposal would introduce an optional feature for assets, and it does that by creating new authorization flags and new operations to take advantage of them. But the goal is to add new functionality to Stellar that would make it easy to issue regulated assets. Now, these new flags will have no effect on accounts that already hold an asset. That means if clawback is not enabled when you obtain an asset, it can't be enabled for you. An issuer can't just come in and change the rules after the fact. Also, when an asset has clawback enabled, that fact will be clearly visible on the issuing account and on the holder's account. In other words, a potential holder will know in advance that an asset has clawback enabled. They'll look at the asset, they'll see that it has clawback enabled, and if they decide to, they can hold it, and they do so fully informed with eyes wide open, right? People opt into holding these assets, and that's a pretty pretty important point. Um, I, I, I sort of mentioned all that just to clarify some, some, some questions that came up last time. Does anyone else, before we dig in, does anyone else have anything to add? Or are we just ready to go? Cool. So CAP 35, um, the current state of this, it is in draft mode. Uh, the question that I think we're ultimately trying to get to is, is it ready uh, to move into final comment period pending acceptance? But there are a couple of changes that have happened since last time. Um, there are some bug fixes that address comments and there's a new set trust lines flag, tr set trust line flags op that allows an issuer to remove clawback, the clawback flag. So, uh, I, I, I think just to open up, does anyone have any comments or questions about the changes since our, we last met? So I, I think that uh, the, first of all, I just wanna congratulate the authors. I think it's just gotten a lot better. Um, uh, I have kind of like, I don't know, three quick comments that like maybe are just changes you can make or, or not. And then one like point for more detailed discussion. So I don't know how, how you wanna, go through this, if we should start raising points or go around Robin or what? Why don't you start with the three quick points and let's just hear what those are. 
Okay, so one, again, this is kind of trivial, but in the set trust line flags op, the clear flags and set flags are pointers. And I was wondering why that is. Uh, is that for future extensibility in case we have like multiple banks of flags or something we want to turn it into a union? Because otherwise, if you just have a, an integer, if you zero, then you're not setting any flags or clearing any flags. So it seemed like the optionality had, was there like redundant mechanisms to not do anything. I was just curious for the rationale. So it matches uh, what set options uh, does, right? So like if you if you don't want to change clear options or like like if you don't want to clear any flags, you can just set it to null, right? So I just I just follow that. I don't I think your approach is fine as well. Uh, I do think we ha there's an advantage in keeping it the same as uh, set options. But sorry, I thought that in set options it actually actually set the thing to a particular value, whereas here we're actually setting or clearing bits, so it's like a different. So set options it, uh, is the same as set trust line flags. I think you're thinking about allow trust that sets it. Oh, uh, right, right. right. Uh, so yeah, the, the goal here was to make it make it similar to set uh, set options, and that you you control specific bits. Um, okay. Well, it's not. Yeah. It's not. Again, th this is pretty minor point. I raise it. It sounds like there's a rationale, so it's not not a huge deal. Um, the. Uh, the other question, so another question is, should we deprecate allow trust op now that we have set uh, trust line flags op? I uh, I think so. I think we should. Uh, but that would be just something to right. mention. Like, you know, we don't have to like remove yeah. it or anything, but we can just deprecate it and like slowly, you know, eventually maybe like, you know, way down the line, remove some, some of these obsolete uh, operations. Um, so third kind of quick point or suggestion is um, in the set line, trust line flags op, instead of having an asset code, should we think about putting an, an asset there? And let me make the case. So it's not cut and dry, but there are advantages. So obviously you might say like, well, right now it's like completely redundant because the issuer should be implicit in whatever the source account is for the operation. However, I can imagine situations where down the line, we might not want that to be the case. And here's kind of two scenarios where having the full uh, asset in there would, would make this easier. So one is maybe there's certain flags that like the issuer can like add the flag or remove the flag, but you can add the flag or something. So we actually want the owner of the trust line to be able to, to change some of the flags and the issuer to be able to change other flags, or maybe the owner can do it in one direction, the issuer in another direction. The second thing, which kind of comes back to this uh, point of feedback that I've gotten a lot from talking to people, which is the annoying thing that if you issue a bunch of assets you uh, and you want a fixed quantity, that uh, if you lock the, um, the high threshold of the account to no one has high threshold, you can no longer rotate the keys that are used to like authorize the trust lines. And so I don't think we want to fix this today, but one thing that one can imagine down the line maybe is adding like a super user flag to like your trust line, which allows you to not only hold the asset, but actually authorize other people to hold the asset, right? I realized like maybe we do want to do this, maybe we don't want to do this. It means looking at another uh, entry in the database when you're transaction processing. So there's arguments against it, but, uh, but, but that would solve this problem. You could like issue an asset, you could like create, you could basically create a super user account to to, to manipulate trust lines and then you could completely lock the original account and then you could still rotate uh, uh, keys in the other account. So just having the full asset in there would allow us to do that because it would allow us this level of indirection that a different account could be the one uh, authorizing and deauthorizing trust lines. And, and I just, just to clarify, you're, you mean the asset code versus the full asset, you mean the asset code say USD versus having USD colon issuer of that asset? Uh, exactly, exactly. Um, and so Actually, right now, the issuer is redundant because it's the source account always, but I can imagine future situations where we don't want to require that to be the case. Actually, I would say so, I would support that. Like originally, actually, in the original proposal, I didn't I didn't care for the clawback operation, so to, to not specify the you know, the full uh, asset, because at the time we only had our trust. But if we're going to make the change to this new allow trust, uh, like we would also make the change to, to clawback, right? And then now we end up with like, this is completely open and and yeah. in the future we can easily make that without having to add new operations basically. So yeah, I totally support that. 
I just want to echo this. I've been hearing from partners uh, this desire to basically delegate um, um, delegate the ability to allow trust to, to separate accounts. Um, right now, we you know we we uh, we promote this idea of everyone needs to have access to the issuer account and, and a low threshold, but there are a lot of issues with this. So if the issuer can actually delegate this authority to other accounts, uh, then um, I think that um, is great. Cool. So I have one more issue that probably is might require more discussion. So I'll maybe defer if other people have quicker things and we can come back to the longer running ones. I think, uh, so it's something I want to comment on this is, I think this is really great. The idea that we can, we can in the future possibly delegate who could run these operations as opposed to it being the issuer. I think that that relates in some ways back to a previous conversation we had about clawback and the fact that um, right now clawback is only going to return the asset to the issuer and there's no ability to specify a destination because I think if we if we start thinking and I think that decision was completely fine if we think about clawback being something only that the issuer operates um, because if they claw something back they can always then issue the asset themselves again but when we start talking about making it flexible enough so that a delegated account could cause the clawback then the clawback is going to return to the issuer um, so then, then we have that. No, no, no. In that case, it would have to go back to the uh, source account, right? Which would be this uh, this other account. So I think it would be consistent with the behavior one. Okay. Like in a fixed in a fixed asset situation, you would actually not be burning uh, assets in this situation. You would actually uh, be moving assets from the account being clawed back to the this kind of uh, you know audit type of. I can't. So, yeah. Is the clawback mechanism set up to claw back to the source account currently? Well, it's implicit, right? It's implicit. Okay. I mean, we could add a destination account. So imagine a situation where whenever you claw back, you actually want to send it to some like arbitrator who's going to like decide whether this is just or not or something as a way to, although really you'd want to kind of force that. So Maybe, maybe that's not such a good idea. I think it's better to have it like go back to the source account. If you're the issuer, you end up burning it. And then uh, if you want to send it to an arbitrator, that's actually the second operation. And then you, you do have clear kind of separation of like you know, uh, what is actually happening in the history. So it sounds like we do we do need to change the, the definition in the cup slightly. To, just to be more clear that the clawback is returning the asset to the source account, and right now the source account is only the issuer. Um, but like, because I think right now it, this language that talks more is more focused on clawback burning the asset rather than moving it. So, so to be clear, like in in Cap thirty five would not be uh, like it actually doesn't make sense to do clawback from a non issuer account because you know you can't actually you don't have the rights to do it. Uh, but I agree in terms of wording, like you know, if you say source account, right, it just works because you know adding this functionality is actually uh, adds a bunch of complexity uh, that I don't want to do in Cap 35 because you have like limits and all that stuff that the issuer doesn't have. Um, so you have like new failure modes. And so the suggestion is just to slightly tweak the language so it's clear that. Okay. Uh, while we're at it, I, I did notice one really nitpicky thing, which is that. Um, this new operation that was added recently, um, set trust lines flag op, does appear in the semantics, but not in the abstract. So while someone's going in to tweak that language, my request is please add that to the abstract portion of the cap. I can take that. Cool. Does does anything does anyone have anything else before we take here David's more potentially rabbit hole question so i have i have one comment related to the uh the suggestion to make the asset code an asset we uh in in the original set trust line flags proposal there was there was a similar change that allowed you allowed either the issuer or the owner of the trust line to operate on the tr operation or operate on the on the trust line flag and one concern that came up that, that john brought up was that he he preferred he would prefer it if we just use a different operation for if the owner wanted to modify the trust line flag, because uh, he 
said, you know, it, it would be, it would make, it would be clearer than allowing this, like this other, uh, this, this brand new functionality, which we don't even allow at the moment, right? Uh, I, I personally, I, I don't think it's, it, it matters that much. I think it's fine if we, if we enable the, the owner of the trust line to modify a flag in the future, but that, that is one concern that he had. So I but that's, that that's, that's a decision. We're not taking that decision today. Like that may be yeah. perfectly fine. All we're saying is we're going to leave the flexibility, not to, otherwise we'd be making a decision today that we have to do it that way. And we're leaving our options open. That was only one of the two uses that I could think of off the top of my head of having a full asset instead of the asset code. The other one being this delegation, which both Tomer and I, I guess, have heard uh, uh, requests for from people. Okay. Yeah, I think that makes sense. All right, David, I think we're ready for your bigger question. Okay, so the, so the bigger question um, is, and I don't know what to do about this, and maybe it's not that big a deal, but the, the, when, you, when you're clawing back a claimable balance, um, the, the problem is that, that whether or not you can claw back a claimable balance depends on the person who created the claimable balance, not the person who can uh, redeem it, right, who can claim it. Um, and this seems like a little bit unfortunate in terms of, uh, for example, you know, how do you ar arbitrate a situation where like, you know, I, I sent you a claimable balance and then like, I couldn't claim it anymore. So I considered it was yours, but it somehow got clawed back before you were able to claim the money. Um, and, uh, and maybe you had some special arrangement where like you didn't have clawback or, or something. Um, so, so this is, uh, so this is bad. And another thing where I think this would come up a lot is kind of at the end of some complicated protocol, like a payment channel or something where you kind of like at the end of the day, I give you a bunch of assets and you give me a bunch of assets. And now it's sort of like, uh, I, I would expect one of those, oh, you know, both, either both happen or neither. And now there's the possibility that kind of the wrong one could get clawed back. Like my funds could get clawed back because you were subject uh, to clawback, uh, but you were the one who'd like created this claimable balance. So given that the claimant, you know, given that you can't, you don't necessarily know who can, um, well, anyway, so that, that that's the problem. So should we do something about this? And do we care? And if so, you know, what should we do? I mean, like to me, that's that's uh, that's actually why I wanted to have this flag in the first place on the on the balance entry because you know if you have if you don't have uh, clawback enabled on the balance entry, basically it's it's uh, immune to kind of interference like that from uh, you know, for smart contracts. Yeah, for the for the ones that do have that flag enabled, I agree. Um, uh, as soon as you as you touch it as an issuer, uh, you're potentially kind of blowing up a whole smart contract. And I yeah, but the problem is, know. like, it feels like in most cases you'll be blowing up the wrong leg of a smart contract. You don't know. The problem is that you don't know. Yeah, so you have to do a lot of like offline type of uh, uh, kind of work before actually uh, doing the, this claim. Can you explain to me what the use case would be in this situation? How you'd be using payment, channel, payment channels with claimable balances for assets that had clawback enabled? Like, is this something that there's that a reasonable person would be using these assets in that way? Sure, I mean, the, the, this like whether or not you want to use the payment channel on an asset should be kind of independent of whether you can claw it back or not. Um, but, uh, but the point is that like most, in most of these protocols, you kind of assume that the funds are yours once you can claim them. Um, and we're now slightly changing that situation and that like the, the, they could still get clawed back because of something bad that the issuer did, even if the recipient has some kind of a, a non-clawback agreement with the issuer. That would be on the recipient's, um, account, right? On their trust line flags, so like the, the sender and the recipient both have this clawback flag that can be set or unset in their trust line. So if the recipient doesn't have it set in their trust line, then they know ahead of time that it, it can't be changed for them. Um, right, except that except that they're the thing, the claimable balance that they can claim can be uh, clawed back, unless I'm misunderstanding. 
Right. Only if, on it, a, only if it has the flag. Only if the sender had the flag and I would right. the sender had the flag. So in, in a way, it's like you wish that the policy had to do with the recipient rather than the sender, I guess is is kind of what I'm saying. But but that also doesn't work, right? Because you don't want to just be, you, I shouldn't be able to like protect my funds by like sending them all, making a bunch of, you know, claimable balances that people can't claim and then reclaiming them afterwards. So I don't know what the solution is. It just, it seems like it's something slightly uh, annoying. Recipients recipients also don't have to exist at the time the claimable balance. Yeah, exactly, created. exactly. So there's, there's no guarantee we even have that information. I think the only the only things we can guarantee exist on the network when the claim balance is created is that the issuer exists and the the account holder exists, the original account, the sender exists. Um, and I think if we were to choose from one or the other where to get that information from, the sender is better because if we use the issuer, then if the issuer enables clawback, then a sender, whenever they create a claim of balance, it's become going to become clawback enabled, even though they maybe have an agreement with the issuer that. That when they hold the asset, it isn't clawed, can't be clawed back. Agreed. So I, I guess my question is, what what does this, where does this conversation lead? What what action needs to be taken to sort of resolve this issue? I, I mean, you know, maybe, maybe we can't resolve it right maybe it's just um uh I, 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 you know it's not there there doesn't seem to be any ideal solution here and you know i agree that it's it's kind of at least as reasonable to have the flag on a claimable balance be based on the sender than to have it be based on the issuer so if the, given that those are kind of the only two options i can see on the table um maybe we just live with it does the spec currently specify using the sender? I can't remember. It, does, it is, yeah, yeah inheriting the, yeah. yeah. Okay, so that's the status. Because that's where, like, like, like the, the reason I wanted that in the first place was because if you're going to engage in a, in a payment channel, let's say, at the beginning, like you can actually look at those flags that people have on their trust lines and decide at this point, do you actually want to basically take the risk or not? Uh, in that payment channel, right? If people don't have the flag set, you know that basically you're taking a zero risk. If you have the flag, then they have a question. Um, yeah, but of I, course I don't flag, see. But the flag can change yeah. like during the execution of a protocol, right? So you no, might... no, no, no. That's the point. Is that the the flag? Once you have, if you have the flag not set, people cannot uh, like the issuer cannot set it back. It can only be unset. Okay. That's a that makes it work. That's that's why this this works, right? Like that's if we were allowing the issuer to to basically renege on the uh, on this, it, it also breaks that. So that would be not. Yeah. So so anyone would be opt. They would understand this fact. They would opt in to choosing to use the asset in that way. Again, eyes wide open. Yeah. Like, but here the important bit is like, you can imagine having some accounts on the network that don't have that flag enabled, even though it is uh, like the issuer has the callback enabled, but they're like, you know, maybe privileged accounts or something like, tier, you know, better tiers basically of accounts that can actually uh, engage into those uh, payment channels or whatever. But like, yeah, I agree that it's not ideal because like really what you would want is like any, any asset, I mean, any uh, account should be able to to participate to payment channels. But like, the thing is that as soon as you, you potentially have this third party kind of interfering, uh, it, it gets really complicated. Uh, I don't see. Yeah, so I, I I can basically live with it. I think you guys have convinced me that this is probably fine, and uh, anything else is going to be worse. I, I think. I also want to mention, I think this is a limitation of claimable balances in general, in that claimable balances, the only the only place they can go is into the account, is into a claim, is into the an account that's defined as a claimant. Um, and so for their use in smart contracts, there's that limitation already. Um, and may, like maybe there's room for improvement in the future for claimable balances to have other destinations. So you know you could take funds from a claimable balance. And move them into another claimable balance or into multiple claimable balances. And 
if you know if that is ever a possibility in the future, you know, that opens up more flexibility for smart contracts um, because um, you know then we can start talking about you know they can inherit the attributes of their previous kind of balances or different things like that. Um, but I, got, that's, I think that's like that's off topic a bit, but I think there is some limitation that we're inheriting from the fact that claimable balances only have accounts as a destination. Okay, well, I'm satisfied. Nothing needs to change in the in the cap, basically. After this, so the, the so the one there's basically one minor change, which is to replace the asset code with the. Oh, asset sorry, code. I meant for the last part of the discussion. For the last part, it sounds yeah. like for the other one, we we agreed that we'll add a note that uh, allow trust stop is deprecated, and we will um, we will add to turn the asset in two places. We'll turn an asset code into an asset, I guess, right? That's correct. I think those are the changes that we've suggested making. Does it, it, it does that seem accurate to everyone else? Yeah. And if so, those feel like pretty, correct me if I'm wrong, Sid, for instance, those feel like pretty minor changes to execute. Is that correct? Yeah, they should be. Like, the, like we could move this into final comment period pending those changes. Does that seem correct? Yeah. All right, guys, I, I say we, uh, I say we move this from draft into final comment period. Um, I, I kind of want to do like a formal process here. We have to say I or, or nay. Um, so let's do that. Let's do that. Uh, Nico. Yes. Uh, Sid. Yes. David. Tomer. Yes. Eric. Yep. Is that uh, is that everybody? I think that's everybody who's on this call. Guys, I actually have a gavel, so I'm going to strike this gavel. And can, can you see it? And and, and that, now it's officially moved into a final comment period. I happen to have that gavel in this room full of junk. I did not go buy it, especially for this. I promise. Um, and so that's mostly it. I mean, the only other thing that I guess we could do, uh, which we can also decide not to do, is is we could talk a bit about where this cap is because I know that some implementation has already been done. Um, do you want to walk us, does anyone want to walk us through that or should we just be happy with this sort of procedural vote that we just had and, and close the meeting? I think that's probably enough for now, like uh, in the context of this meeting. Okay, cool. Meetings that end early are great. There's, there's just no reason to stretch right. out to the full time if you're done. Okay, cool. So we're going to move Victory. in into final comment period pending those changes. So when they're done, I will send out the official notice on the Stellar Dev list. And again, anyone who's watching, that gives you a week. To, for final suggestions, we can reopen the discussion if it seems necessary, but this is final comment period pending acceptance. Great, well, we answered the questions. We moved this along. I think we're done. Everybody feel good? Great. Yeah, thanks well, everyone. Thanks everyone for coming. Thanks everyone for watching. See you next time. Cheers, see ya. Bye.